Welcome to The Faith Alive, a series from the Diocese of Harrisburg that explores and explains the teachings of the Catholic faith. As we continue our discussion on vocations, today we're going to focus on the priesthood. I'm happy to be joined today by Father Jonathan Sawicki, the vocations director for the Diocese of Harrisburg. Father Sawicki, welcome. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you for joining us today. Would you explain for our viewers, what is the process to become a priest? It's particular, Bishop, to every candidate who steps forward. A young man will step forward and say, I want to join the priesthood. Father, I want to be a priest. And I say, well, this begins a conversation. This is, uh, if you think of it as a dating relationship uh, that many people are familiar with, it takes time. It takes uh, discernment. When people say, what's discernment? It's prayerful decision-making. You have to consider uh, what are the motives and desires of the man? Why is he stepping forward and saying this? Sometimes people are ready to go right out the gate. They have had a great uh, experience of the Catholic faith, the Christian faith in their family. They are uh, capable of education. They are uh, prayerful men. They, they understand the sacraments. The, they, they understand the, the depths of the faith. And then other ones, it's the beginning initial stages of their discernment. They're, they're considering this, this uh, prospect of becoming a priest. So the first stage is the discernment phase. And then when there's this comfort that, yes, I, I think the, they, they come to that stage where the only way they'll know for sure whether they're called is the ultimate test of the vocation, which is called seminary, where you go through the academic formation, the community life, the community prayer, the more intensive um, spiritual direction with a spiritual director, as well as a formation advisor. And during the course of seminary, uh, they are, First, they have to study philosophy in order to learn how to think rationally, and then they will move on to theology. So the process before seminary could take a year, two years, maybe even longer, but while they are working on their um, human and spiritual qualities of, of preparedness. And then during the course of seminary, it may last anywhere from six to nine years, depending what education they had prior to their discernment, uh, the preparations during seminary, both philosophy and theology. And that process also involves even things outside the seminary, which is the seminary and program that's directly connected to the diocese. For instance, we'll have uh, men who go to the Institute of Priestly Formation during their summers, which is in Creighton, Nebraska. We have some men who will go to Mexico to learn Spanish. We have a, a seminarian this summer who is uh, learning another second language called American Sign Language. So that way the deaf community in our diocese can continue to have priestly service. Uh, so what's the process and how long it takes? It depends on the candidate. How long is typically six to nine years, give or take. Uh, and the, the candidate, depending on how much education is necessary and, and their preparedness, um, that discernment might last anywhere one, two years before seminary. Okay. So it really is, we, we can't just have an assembly line. Um, the church is, was not served well when we thought we could assembly line mass-produced priests. Right. And it's, it's through that subjective and introspective, both the seminarian looking at uh, his desires and his heart and, and his, his understanding of who he is as a child of God, as well as the church, represented by the seminary, represented by the summer assignment pastors, home parish pastors, the vocation director, looking and saying, we're going to help you with this, and this is for you, or this may be not be for you. Sure. Clearly, this is a very multifaceted process, and there's no uh, cookie-cutter no. approach to the formation for the priesthood. But certainly in your conversations with an initial candidate and as they progress, and then the formators at the seminary, you're all looking for certain qualities in a man, the beginning of those qualities, and then to see if they develop, mature. Uh, could you describe some of those individual qualities that, that a person, a man, needs to have uh, as he progresses toward ordination? I think first, the man has to be a man of faith, has to be a man of prayer. They have to, they have to know how to pray. Uh, the first quality of, of prayer, and it can't just be, oh, I say a couple Hail Marys a day. 
that's a good start, well, how is your devotion to the Eucharist? That's, that's, that's that quality. Is the, because a priest, his life is centered around the daily celebration of the Eucharist and that adoration of the Eucharist, the, the love of the Eucharist. So the encouragement is given, can you make 15 minutes of a visit at the Adoration Chapel or staying in your church before Mass or after Mass or on the way home from work or at, on the ca college campus at school or in the high school at the, the campus chapel? the dedication and love of the Eucharist, Marian devotion, uh, the daily rosary, uh, prayers with the scripture, the sacred scriptures, praying with sacred scriptures, and you could get into retreats regarding either Ignatian meditation or Lectio Divina, but being able to have a familiarity because seminary, the priesthood, uh, this any religious formation, it's not just memorizing facts, it's ultimately a relationship with God a relationship deeply in love with God. So it has to be rooted in that relationship, which is born of faith. Mm -hmm. But then the second aspect and foundational is the human qualities of the man. Is he able to be dependable? Is he a man of his word? Is he respectful of himself and of others? Does he, uh, does he respect those in authority? Does he love the poor? And so these are all things that which we try to gauge in a person and help mentor. And during the course of seminary, for instance, we have uh, St. Charles Borromeo in Philadelphia sends out on the Thursday apostolate and they're sent out to, whether it's a nursing home or a school, a hospital, prison, a, a place, a food distribution warehouse. And our seminarians who have experienced these things, they come back and say, wow, I didn't realize what poverty was. Or then another seminary might come back and say, yeah, I can't see myself doing this. Well, why? Yeah, it's just, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with it. Well, let's learn to be comfortable because this is what Jesus asks us to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that what, what qualities we look for, the spiritual aspects, the, the, the man is a man of prayer, the human aspects, that he's a healthy man, both in his own personal health and mental health, as well as that healthy relationship that he should have. He's a man able to work with women. You know, sometimes you have to ask the question, um, is, is the person uh, not dating because he's frustrated with women? I mean, you have to delve into that at times and to say, well, you know, wherever you work in the church, you're going to be working with women and to be able to respect them and, you know, not think that you're... Uh, 1950s and Ward Cleaver is going to come home from from work and June is going to present uh, the evening meal. I mean, that's la la land and we have to live in that reality. And th these are all the things that we look for, those those healthy spiritual and human qualities in a candidate before entering seminary as well as during seminary. And I think that it's important for the lay faithful of our diocese to know that these things are being looked at and and um, and examined and and hopefully fostered. Yeah. And ultimately, they have to be able to be educated. A, a, a priest has to be able to explain the faith. They can't be Thomas Aquinas. One of them come around, there's one Thomas Aquinas, maybe per millennium, I suppose. But they have to be able to, um, to, to, be able to explain um, in an accessible manner the truths of our Catholic faith. Very good. Thank you, thank you, that was good. And, and of course, you look at, at to these positive qualities to be present, at least in a rudimentary form. The very meaning of seminary is kind of like a, a hothouse, a greenhouse where the seeds, seeds are there and, and they need to come to maturity, they need, need to grow, and that's the process of formation. Do they grow or, or don't they? So if, if an individual decides to go into seminary, is, is, that, is he now in lockstep for the rest of his <laughs> life? Or uh, what happens if I'm... Uh, miserable after my first three months. So oftentimes I'll say to a candidate, there's first saying, the, one of the first famous sayings in seminary is never make a decision in February. February <laughs> in Pennsylvania is a dark, dreary, miserable month. And so you say never make a decision in February. Uh, and there are times that you, you have to just give things time. Often, mostly I'll say to someone, give it, if you enter seminary, give it two years because 
it might be that the first time that you're away from home if you're a younger guy or you've you've lost certain freedom and autonomy if you're an older candidate after having maybe a brief career or a long career and it might be why I'm, my gosh I'm stuck in this place I have morning prayer evening prayer night prayer classes and group uh, prayer groups and small groups and I just want to go and watch the game all Monday evening well but you have to write that paper and that could wear on someone and as a vocation director, you have to challenge a man. Uh, this is the cross. And if you're a husband and father, there are going to be times that you want to do what you want to do. But your wife and your children are going to need husband and father first. Mm -hmm. And that's the cross. Now, it's also a joy. And that's why we say that it's a cross of gladness. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if the then there's the times where a man enters seminary and it's just absolutely not working. I remember saying uh, to a friend of mine from seminary, he said, I'm leaving seminary. And I said, it's a good thing. Well, why? Because you've been absolutely miserable as a seminarian. <laughs> and he said, you think so? I said, it's evident. Yeah. And I said, what? And, and he met a girl and I did their wedding, <laughs> you know, <laughs> years ago. And he's a wonderful, uh, dedicated lay member of our local church. Um, and, a, and an educator and a wonderful husband and, and father. Uh, so, and, and that's okay. You know, you're entering seminary. It, you're not signing on the dotted line for the rest of your life. You're just making a statement. I think God's calling me to this and I need the church to help me understand if this is indeed the case. On that note, it's always important when a young man may enter seminary that his parents, that the diocese, that his parish give him that space and say, um, we, we love you, we support you, but you don't owe anything to us except to do this honestly. Uh, and it's always important. I've always, even before I was a director of vocations, I'd recommend to parents, give him space that in case he, he, he needs to step out of seminary, you can do this and there's no disappointment in doing that. Yeah. I think one of the, you know, the domestic church is the family where you learn the love of God, the father and the, 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 the nurturing of the church mm -hmm. from the from dad and from mom. And I think that one of the most important things my own father ever said to me, he said, uh, son, it's OK if you leave. My parents said this to me when they dropped me off in August of 2001 at St. Charles. If this isn't for you, it's OK to leave. And then halfway through seminary, my dad looked at me, and said, son, if you're going to be a priest, be a good priest. Be a good one, okay? Mm -hmm. Because as a lifelong Catholic, I think he's seen his, his share of ones that were admired and ones that were frustrating. Mm. I think that's the experience of a lot of us. Surely, surely. And uh, I, I've told that to many parents over the years, uh, to give your son that freedom, um, to know that uh, you support him, you love him, and if he decides to leave the seminary, that is uh, the right decision for him. Yes. And it, uh, and you support that as well. Um, and I've also told men who are considering it, you'll never regret going and trying the seminary. Because I have met men older in life, actually two interesting cases, on their deathbeds, and they said, you know, Father, I, I really think I should have been a priest. Uh, they never tried it. And even at an elderly age, they were still somehow haunted by a decision that they didn't make. Yes. And uh, so there's, there's no disgrace whatsoever of trying the seminary and deciding this isn't God's will. But I think not to do so, if you have some inkling that it might be, uh, will kind of rob you of some peace maybe throughout your life. And, and I've met parents, uh, older parents older in life, who maybe they, only, they, admo they admonish their only son, don't think about this, we need a family, you know, do something good with your life, do something successful with your life and they've regretted not encouraging their son when he might have thought right. about it. Yeah, good. So parents, a good message for parents. Parents as well. Um, at some point in formation, the candidate has to come to a clear resolve that I can live a happy, balanced life as a male in celibacy. I'm going to talk about that. Why, why does the church uh, require celibacy for our priests in the Latin church? And... Um, Give, give us some thoughts on that. So those, those of our uh, diocesan church who attend 
any of the ordinations that we celebrate. Uh, know that you ask the question at the diaconate ordination, do you promise celibacy? Now, my problem is we've tweaked the language in the process of translation, so I don't remember the exact question that you give them, but it's twofold sign as a sign of pastoral charity and as a sign of the kingdom to come, or as a sign of God's kingdom. So you remember in the Gospels, Matthew's Gospel, where in heaven they are neither given, they are neither married nor given in marriage. So there's a scriptural emphasis that celibacy is a sign of that kingdom to come. And it's also a sign that what we do as, as celibate men, we're not building an earthly legacy as much as trying to build up the kingdom of God. And the pastoral charity aspect is that we are supposed to not just be uh, perpetual bachelors who are able to live a cushy lifestyle in church-supplied houses, the luxurious rectories that we have. And it's, it's really as a sign that we are freed in order to be 24 hours a day on call as best as we can, as humanly speaking, but we are, we are to be freed to be a member of so many families because we are relieved of the responsibility of our own family. I'll sometimes say to people, well, Father, you're a very busy person. Or, Father, will you be able to meet in the evenings? Can you meet, is it okay to meet at seven o'clock in the evening? And I'm thinking, seven o'clock in the evening is still early for many priests. I said, listen, this is why we're celibate, in order to be free for you, to, to help you, as, as you're, to, to be able to serve your family needs or your schedule. Um, it's that twofold sign. It's, the problem is when there have been some priestly examples where they haven't been so self-giving. And I, I'm not naive to know that that has frustrated some, some of our faithful. But why do we do this? It's the sign of the kingdom to come when they are neither married nor given in marriage. And as a sign of pastoral charity, that we are freer, that we are to be more flexible in serving the people of God. So celibacy makes us uh, freer from the responsibilities of married and family life, yes, so that we are freer for service to Correct. Uh, the people of God. But there are still, I'm sure, some people who think celibate equals lonely, oh. uh, and I don't like that, and so I can't no. even consider. Would you, would you comment about the loneliness uh, and celibacy? So. I come from a family, I come from parents, I'm blessed to have two brothers and two sisters, and I have two brothers-in-law and a sister-in-law. In my th almost 13 years of priesthood, I've met lonely married men and women. If there's a lonely priest, it's a very good chance that he could just as well have been a lonely husband if they're not able to have that uh, interchange of a friendship with someone. There's been many times, there have been many times that I've been alone. I, I kind of appreciate downtime and quiet time in the rectory in the evenings or in the early morning. You're able to just read a, news, read a newspaper or just uh, disconnect from things and just uh, or take, take a walk along the river or something like that and just be, I, you need alone time. But as many times as I've been alone, I've never felt lonely because I know that there have been people who would be very willing to open their door and say, or they say on, on Holy Saturday, Father, would you come up to our house and, and eat with us before the Easter Vigil? Every year of my priesthood, Father, you have some place to go for Thanksgiving, but Father, you are going to the Super Bowl party, right? You have a, you have a party to go to tonight? I've never had the, not had those opportunities. I think it's the interior disposition of the person. If you want to feel abandoned, you will look to be abandoned, mm -hmm. okay? And I think that that's the challenge for the people who might think that, it's what is your attitude in which you're uh, encountering the other people, okay? So are they alone? Are they in, alone in the house? Yes, but does that mean that they have to be lonely and, and separated from people or not having healthy friendships or priestly fraternity? I know it's an encouragement in the diocese that priests join fraternity groups, whether it's a Jesu Caritas or the Emmaus group, where you get together once a month and some people vacation with each other to have that priestly fraternity, which is incredibly important because celibacy should not mean that you're on an island. It means that you are freed 
to have relationship with many. Um, it's also a, a sad thing about our society where we think that the culmination of the human person is as a sexual person. I think that that, you know, people will sometimes say, why is the church hung up on sex? It's more like m most of the time it's the people who are hung up on it and they're just asking the church about, you know, why are you talking about this all the time? Well, because you're always asking those questions about that. Mm -hmm. But we're not the sum of the sexual identity, which people, people reduce celibacy as to just mere sex. In reality, it's about the freedom of the heart and the ability to have friendship which is really um, reflective of the love of the Trinity itself. Very good. That's certainly been my experience that without my own family, so many families have opened their homes and their hearts yes. uh, to in want to include me. Uh, and and I, know, I know that's the uh, general experience, I think, of, of most of our, our priests. And uh, loneliness is, a, is some, most of the time a choice that we make, I think, not, not something that's inherent in the state of celibacy. So Father Sawicki, as director of our diocesan office of vocations, um, if a young man is thinking uh, about the priesthood, perhaps one of our viewers right now is have something in his mind that this is a possibility, maybe this is what God wants uh, for me. Uh, what, what, what should that young man, what should they who might be thinking about it do? First, so it, they could either go in two different directions. They could reach out directly to me, and we begin that conversation. It's a cup of coffee, or um, I like to meet with the person and say, tell me about yourself. I want to know where they're coming from, and then we could give that, that next steps. So if they're, if they're good at reading, I like to give them, like, the priest is not his own, to have an understanding of priesthood. Or if they need help with prayer, a book on prayer, like Introduction to the Devout Life. I said, you know, I need you to work on this prayer life. And so I'll do that with the person. Um, and then there are times where you see that this person is well prepared. You say, "Would you want an application?" Well, Father, let me think about that. I said, "That offer's there. It's not going to. It's not going to expire anytime soon, <laughs> um, because I don't want to push someone into uh, doing something that they're not ready to do yet." They could, or they could reach out directly to one through their parish priest. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a, a very important uh, first step as well, mm -hmm. because if they reach out to me first one of the first things I do is call their parish priest and say, do you know this, this young person? Sure. Do you know this man? Uh, do you know him to be a good man of faith and virtue? And because I'll send that young man back to his parish priest to say, I need you to go to him regularly for confession. Or uh, I know there was one young discerner, or a young man who was on the periphery of discernment who shadowed his uh, home parish pastor for a day. And now... It didn't come to anything right now, and who knows if it ever will. That's mm -hmm. the, the Holy Spirit knows that. But I think that that, um, that first step of talking to a priest, something I learned from another vocation director, or maybe one of the people we use for the mental, the psychological evaluations, I asked a young man, and I, I asked our priests to ask that young man, do you understand what a priest does and what the priesthood is? To have that understanding that, you know, it's not just you get up there and you point your finger and tell people what the sin of the week is, but what it means to be a spiritual father and how to serve people. Um, and so I think that that pastoral relationship directly with the priest is very important. Yeah. Well, we've come to the end of our program today, Father, but thank you so, so very much for joining me and uh, for sharing uh, your experiences, uh, your thoughts here with us. And uh, I would say to everyone, uh, of course, while Father Sawicki is our director for vocations in the diocese, he's not the only one in the diocese who needs to be promoting vocations. Every one of us uh, shares in that obligation to promote vocations and especially to the priesthood here for the Diocese of Harrisburg. And again, it's not just our priest, but, but all of us. If, if you see a young man whom you think may be showing signs in your opinion, of, of being uh, possibly a sign of a vocation to the priesthood, mention that to him, affirm him, or encourage uh, that individual, uh, because we all need to be actively engaged in this work of promoting vocations uh, to the priesthood. So I thank you uh, all for joining me, and until the next time, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. 
Amen. Amen.